welcome everybody. It's really my pleasure to um, have to uh, give the introduction to one more Cubic Tech Talk. Today, we're very happy to welcome Evan Evangelia Petzalaki, um, who accepted our invitation to contribute here to our Tech Talk series. Meanwhile, we're used to the to the virtual setting. Um, in, in in old days, we had like uh, live uh, seminars uh, here in Tübingen. Um, we just discussed in the forefront. It also has some advantages to have it virtually because we can uh, easier organize the sessions and potentially we can also spread out the word more. So I, I, will, I will just give you a few um, steps towards Fanglia's. Um, CV. So it's, she did her PhD in Heidelberg, working on um, yeah, peptide and, and protein interactions, uh, I guess around proteomics, but maybe you can also tell us a little bit more about it. And then she went for a postdoc to, to the Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. And since 2017, uh, you're back in, in Germany working as a, no, not in Germany, but with the Embel EBI, but some connections to Heidelberg, I've heard, um, working as, as a group leader. And yeah, now I, I give the word to you and we're really looking forward to, to your contribution. Thanks a lot for joining. Thank you very much, Sven, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, to give this talk in your uh, seminar series. Um, uh, as, as Sven said, I, I am at the EBI now, a group leader since 2017. Um, it's in uh, Hingston, nearby Cambridge. Uh, but yeah, we do have connections with the mothership, which is in uh, EMBL Heidelberg. And before COVID, uh, we, we used to go there quite a lot. But uh, unfortunately, travel has been restricted now. So we haven't been in a while. Um, yeah, so um, my, my work, um, my, my group is interested in uh, context-specific cell signaling. And um, sorry, let me see how to, oh, there it is. Okay. So when we talk about uh, cell signaling, uh, just to bring everybody on the same page, uh, we are talking about the processes that happen in a cell when uh, the environment changes. So in response to change in the environment or cell-cell communication, uh, there's a cell signaling happens in the cell. So typically when we talk about it or when we think about it, we, we um, think about uh, a, a layer where the cell perceives this change or this communication, then we have a, a layer of stuff happening. And then we have, let's say the final cellular response, which usually is represented by um, a series of uh, transcription factor, um, uh, transcription factors being activated and then changing the cell behavior. Um, however, even though we do we do uh, con uh, usually describe it and think about it as quite a, a linear uh, a process, uh, everybody now knows that in fact uh, this stuff that happens in the cell, this is basically the signaling mechanism, is actually uh, mostly um, is, is actually uh, represented by very complex networks. Uh, that uh, uh, that exert this um, uh, function for for the for 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 the cell to change the behavior, um, and what's more, um, these uh, networks are not fixed. So in fact, they are very context specific. Here on the right hand side, you see a study from uh, Stacey et al, where they took all the interactions from uh, different databases, including Quorum, which is a highly uh, curated database of uh, protein uh, complexes. And uh, they checked uh, a lot of uh, protein uh, interactome studies, uh, raw data from a lot of protein interactome studies and co-fractionation experiments. And they said, okay, how many times do these, uh, uh, how, how is the presence, is this interaction or are these two uh, proteins that supposedly interact uh, correlated or anti-correlated? How, and how many samples of these that we studied are they anti-correlated? And we see here that actually even uh, a, a large fraction of them are anti-correlated, so they are not interacting in all conditions uh, in, in these uh, in studies. And even, even the, the very high quality complexes are not always uh, interacting with each other in all samples. Um, and as an additional study here recently, uh, the, the, the latest Bioplex uh, uh, data set where they did uh, pull downs uh, in uh, 293 T cells and in HCT116 cells uh, for, uh, for um, the overlap was basically for 50% of the of the human or film, they found that only about 50% of the interactions were shared and the rest were unique to the specific cell line. So this is to bring that bring home the point that even even though uh, we have these, let's say pathways annotated, and we think that they are, this is how they are. In fact, they, it's not that it's not true, because every um, uh, in every cell context, in every condition, they are different. Um, 
so so yeah to summarize this bit so basically the 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 the, the cell signaling acts through context specific complex protein interaction networks and so to start studying them it's very difficult so where do you start so um in the in disease context uh, a lot of the time signal networks are deregulated uh, or rewired and so sometimes we know the point where this happens and so they are uh, the disease contexts are a good system to start studying cell signaling um so another problem when you're trying to study uh, cell signaling is uh, that uh, even if, that we don't really know that much of, uh, as, as much as we think about it so here you see uh, the number of publications that are linked to a protein kinase. And here is, a, again, the number of publications linked to kinases that these kinases would be regulating. And we see that there's a very high number here in the top right corner um, showing that, uh, you know, well-studied kinases phosphorylate and regulate uh, well-studied -substr well substrate kinases. This might be because we study the most interesting kinases, but it's more likely because uh, we haven't really had a look at <laughs> at, uh, at these guys. And in fact, uh, studies, uh, unbiased studies of protein interactomes have shown that um, uh, the interactions are pretty much evenly distributed across the entire Orpheum. Um, uh, and, there, and, and there's very small, there's no real bias um, uh, for different uh, proteins. I mean, there are hubs, but, uh, but, uh, but there, there's this picture here is, is much more uh, likely because of the study bias rather than the functional importance of a given kinase. So the point here is that we have a huge understudied space. Um, what that means is that every time you do an enrichment analysis and you think you're getting all the pathways that are represented in your data set, in fact, you're not. You're, you're probably discarding a large fraction of your data. Um, so it's something to look into. So um, these things are, 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 are basically motivating the whole uh, uh, research of my group. And uh, just to give you an overview of what we do, uh, uh, since uh, I, I haven't uh, previously given a talk to, to your institute, um, uh, basically uh, as a group we study the rules of context-specific human cell signaling and it's rewiring in different conditions and perturbations. And uh, because of the large bias and, and context specificity, uh, we try to take data-driven approaches for this. Uh, and we try to address the following questions. First of all, what is the unit of the cell signaling network? Um, so if, if, um, if the pathways that are annotated there are not really um, uh, present everywhere, uh, so they, they cannot be the unit of the cell signaling network. So what is the unit of the cell signaling network and does it even exist? And for that, we use phosphoproteomics data. We try to, to study how these units interact and cross talk upon perturbation. And we, we rely a lot on CRISPR-based essentiality data and proteogenomics approaches for this. Um, we also then want to know how does the cell signaling interact with the gene regulation and metabolism, because of course it doesn't function in a vacuum. It, it interacts with the different layers of regulation of the cell. And then in fact, how does the signaling result in the change in what changes in the behavior of the cell in the phenotype? How does how's that relationship uh, happen? So this is basically what are the major axes of the, the research in my group. And today I will just uh, talk about uh, two projects. In the first project, uh, we uh, want to study what are the effect of perturbations on signaling network rewiring um, uh, as a big picture. And, and specifically, we want to use CRISPR to dissect context dependent uh, cancer signaling networks. And, uh, and then the, and the other set, uh, in the other project that I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the data-driven approach to expand our knowledge of cell signaling to the understudied space through data-driven inference of kinase regulatory networks. And I'm just going to say, have one or two slides on, on, the, on this uh, method in case somebody is interested in collaborating with us on, on, on this, uh, just uh, um, um, as an added uh, point. So let's start. So as I mentioned before, uh, disease contexts are very useful for um, <coughs> um, for studying cell signaling and melanoma is a very useful uh, disease among diseases because it is uh, strongly driven by aberrant cell signaling. So most of the driver mutations uh, are in genes that are related to cell signaling processes, specifically uh, BRAF map kinase pathway. Um, and, uh, and, and, and as you can see here, 60% have uh, BRAF, of patients have BRAF mutations and 20% have NRAS mutations. Um, and so uh, it, it, we, we, we really know that this is the pathway we, ha we, can, we have to start when we're trying to study uh, rewiring in melanoma. Um, and also, um, since it's very, very uh, specific um, 
in pathway there have uh, there are of course uh, uh, many known uh, um, uh, many known drugs that target uh, this pathway but uh, with that of course come in many uh, mechanisms to, for uh, resistance so so you have uh, here a whole series that I'm not going to to go through but uh, there are also many more unknown uh, ways that the cell rewires their signaling to adapt uh, and and overcome uh, the, the the perturbation with the drug so here we want to understand the signaling and how does the signaling network uh, rewiring happens in the context of drug resistance in melanoma and uh, for this i will i will talk about first the uh, send tools which is uh, um, sends our context specific essentiality networks and this is a web server that we developed um, uh, spearheaded by subana and uh, jansu and helped also by paula um, to uh, basically navigate better these large-scale essentiality data sets so that we can extract this kind of context-specific essentiality networks to then use for understanding signal network rewiring. And then the second project is going to be very, it's still in progress, it's going to be a, a, a protogenomics a project to understand the effect on signaling rewiring. So for this, uh, we use cell line models. Uh, and just to, sh to, co to sh convince you that th this uh, is our good system for studying uh, uh, um, melanoma drug resistance, here you see the distribution of the mutations in the different cell lines that we have data for. And there are about 33 melanoma cell lines, and they are um, genomically and transcriptomically characterized. They have, uh, for a subset, matched drug information and also essentiality CRISPR based screen. Um, and for some of them, we also have uh, um, uh, screens upon uh, drugs. Uh, drug perturbation, and you see that the distribution of the mutations is very similar to the patients. So we have mostly BRAF and NRAS mutations and, and some other ones that are mostly around the MAP kinase pathway. Um, yeah, and, and why do you want to use essentiality screens? Uh, they are very useful for um, uh, pinpointing the vulnerabilities of a cell in different conditions. Uh, and, and so therefore they act as a proxy of the dominant, let's say, uh, networks in the cell. So, for example, um, if you have if you do a, a whole genome screen uh, using CRISPR um, for <coughs> to, to identify uh, genes that are um, essential for in in the context of uh, drug perturbation, then you can find uh, the genes that are, are re related to drug resistance. Or, for example, um, in the context of the melanoma BRAF mutations, then you have uh, cells that are um, that have very dominant BRAF signaling, and therefore uh, this is essential for for them. And therefore, if you kill it, then you you um, kill the cells, and so you this way you can use it as a proxy of how the cells have rewired for uh, their signaling. Um, if you combine it with drug response data, as I said, you can find uh, vulnerabilities associated with uh, resistance or non-responsiveness. And uh, luckily, uh, the last few years, we have uh, uh, to thank uh, the Sanger Institute and the Broad uh, for generating huge data sets with uh, CRISPR essentiality screens across hundreds of cell lines. So, uh, so now when we have all these cell lines, uh, it's not very straightforward to analyze it because um, you have to first say which ones are uh, core, uh, core essential genes, so essential for all the cell lines. Uh, so these are, are somewhat interesting to define uh, the, the, the major process that are required in all cells, but actually what we care about more are the context dependent essential genes. And, and these are only required in particular contexts. And, and this is important because these are good targets uh, for cancers that have this uh, specific context. Um, but it's not really straightforward to say which ones are core, how many, how many cell lines does a gene have to be essential in to call it a core gene, for example. Um, so in order to, to, to help the analysis of this, and also for us, for our, our downstream projects, we decided to do a unified analysis uh, of the data sets to define, specifically with the goal of defining uh, context-specific essential genes and creating them, um, visualizing them in a, in a way that, um, that is, is useful for, for, um, for for this kind of uh, um, studies, um, and, and this is in BioArchive, and actually it was it is pretty much accepted in molecular systems biology. So hopefully you'll see it uh, soon. And um, basically it has two parts. Uh, one was the part that's underlying uh, the the web server, and the other one is what the server is doing basically. So first. Uh, we took all the CRISPR screens and uh, and using uh, uh, known genes of known essential genes, we were able to um, define, let's say, a new set of uh, core genes. Um, uh, not, uh, actually, four clusters. Oh, one, do I have it here? Yeah, I have it. So four clusters. Um, and let's say the cluster one uh, for all the cell lines. You see here is a big peak um, uh, of uh, of uh, probability of being essential at one. So this is essentially. 
uh, all the genes are essential in most of the cell lines. So this is the core essential genes. And then we have uh, one cluster here that most of the, um, uh, all, that, the genes, uh, that the genes are um, non-essential in all, all the um, cell lines. And then we have two clusters uh, with vari uh, variable skewness towards the one or the zero. So let's say in cluster two, we have quite a lot of cell lines that are essential, but they're not essential for everything. So these are context specific essential genes. And these are essential for very few cell lines. So these are rare context specific um, genes. So we have these kind of four categories and this is the basis of, uh, of, um, of, of the web server. Uh, and then for the web server, sorry. Oh, uh, I should say, I should talk a bit more about the, the chorus genes, sorry. Um, just to show, to convince you that the performance for our approach is, is good. Uh, here's the, um, precision, uh, the ROC curve and the precision recall curve for um, based on the benchmark on the original, um, based on cross validation from the original uh, high confidence, uh, well annotated known uh, core essential genes. And if we did, we did a separate analysis of the broad data and the Sanger data, and uh, here's the overlap of, of, of these. Um, and here is also the, um, the genes that uh, were identified by an algorithm called ADAM, which, is, uh, ad, uh, which had used the Sanger data. Uh, to the original standard data set to identify core essential genes. I should note that these uh, exclude the genes used, for example, for training. So that's why there are so few. Um, and then the idea is to, to, to okay, are these, are these genes, uh, how, what kind of evidence, additional evidence do we have that they are, are good? So um, we know that essential genes are in generally higher expressed than the non-essential uh, genes uh, from uh, the, from, from other from the literature, and and actually you can see here that uh, both this overlap and this overlap is similarly expressed as essential genes. So this is some uh, additional support for for the quality of this set. Um, so these twenty here that we missed, if you look into the the Broad versus Sanger analysis, you see that they actually have opposite uh, opposite performance um, in the cell lines, and this suggests that. Uh, the gRNAs used for these knockouts in one of the libraries have different performance than the other. So this is something to, to look into if you're interested in specific genes and uh, you want to use one library versus the other for, for a knockout of these genes. Um, and then yeah, we once... have a question, if you yeah, don't mind. Of course, of course. Um, so Sven is asking, how robust is the label core central, central genes? Do you define core central genes for different diseases, treatments, or does the label change from experiment to experiment? So the, the data is generated uh, based on, uh, so these cell lines are without treatment. So they are 500 cell lines uh, or more or less, or 600 cell lines that have, um, uh, that have, uh, have, have done uh, a CRISPR-based essentiality screen, whole genome CRISPR-based essentiality screen on them. It, there's no treatment on them. Yeah. So we, we don't, uh, it's, it's pretty robust in the sense that uh, if you look at the plots here, you see here that the core essential genes uh, they are essential for all of them, all of the cell lines. Here's the distribution of the cell lines for which they're essential. So across all of these cell lines, they are core essential. I guess if you want to be very precise, you want to say they are essential for these specific cell lines. So maybe there is a cell line where they are not essential. But uh, um, but since there are so many cell lines, um, I think uh, we consider this to be a pretty robust set, especially uh, given the performance of uh, finding the known essential genes and also the, um, actually there is another data set that came out uh, since we did this analysis uh, by Pancini et al. So uh, spearheaded by Francesco Iorio, where they did the integrative analysis of the broad and the Sanger data sets. And we, we have this actually in the supplementary materials of the paper we integrated and we have a very big overlap also with their identified core essential genes. So I think we are very um, confident about our core essential genes, um, that they are they represent functional processes. And uh, um, I don't think I have this in here. Oh, no, we don't. But um, if you look at uh, what genes these are actually, um, they basically, the majority of them uh, add genes to known essential processes. So, so I don't know, a ribosome, uh, are any processing? I don't know what they, they. There are some genes that are known to be essential, and then we add genes to those. So essentially, they, they're complementing our existing knowledge, and they also ha provide a, 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 a few new processes that we identify as essential. Um, I th if I remember correctly, one of them is the um, is related to endocytosis, uh, COP2. What was the complex? COP2. I don't remember right now, but it's related to endocytosis. And so there are other processes that are um, uh, 
uh, that makes sense to be core essential, let's say, across all the cells. So we are pretty convinced that it's a robust set. Well, did I answer the question? Hello. Uh, I think I think so. Otherwise, maybe you can ask again. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, so now that we have this uh, set of core genes and we also have the rest are context specific, we want to, uh, to do statistical associations whereby we say, okay, um, if I take all the genes in, in one group, uh, all the cell lines that have uh, one context, for example, BRAF mutation versus the ones that don't, or all the, the skin cells versus the rest, uh, is there a context specific essentiality and, and enrichment? And then we do this across all the cell lines and then we do a context specific and then we put them together in networks. So I'll show you some examples. Uh, so for example, here we have um, um, a mutation on BRAF as a context. So we have the mutated context versus the non-mutated context. And we see that in the mutated context, BRAF essentiality is significantly higher. Uh, similarly for MAP kinase one, which is downstream of BRAF, it makes total sense. Um, we also have, uh, we also provide information about the, uh, the relationship between essentiality and response to a specific drug. Um, and you can see here that uh, uh, the more essential uh, BRAF is, uh, the more um, um, effective the, the drug is. Uh, this targets uh, BRAF. Um, also we have uh, uh, in different, um, you can pick different subsets of your, cell, of your cells to query again. So, even though these two guys don't have a relationship across uh, pan cancer or across all the cell lines, if you restrict to skin, uh, they seem to have a, a relationship uh, between their essentialities. Um, and these are, I think, lineage markers actually for skin. Um, we also have, you can do paralog analysis. So these two guys are paralog. So uh, when this one is mutated, then suddenly the paralog becomes essential. Also makes sense. Uh, similarly for uh, um, amplification, so whenever there is, uh, so RB2 here is amplified versus not, and of course when it's amplified, um, it is more essential. Um, similarly for uh, microsatellite instability, and this is a, a gene that was uh, discovered also in that uh, paper where Adam was published as well. And uh, basically the, the, we put all of these kind of information together and we offer visualization of dependencies as a network. So here you have, for example, the coessential genes of BRAF, like most uh, tools out there uh, actually display. But if you look at it uh, as a SEN, as what we call SEN, um, you see clearly here that uh, the, uh, the relationship between SOX10 and BRAF is not because of the BRAF mutation, but because actually it's in skin. So in fact, SOX10 is a skin specific transcription factor. And so are these two other guys. So you can start to tease out um, confounding factors uh, from this kind of analysis using this, this kind of uh, uh, network visualization. And uh, we have found it uh, very helpful. Uh, for example, one case study is, uh, is the following. So as I mentioned, in the uh, BRAF melanoma, we have a super active uh, uh, BRAF uh, make ERK pathway. Uh, and actually this leads to activation of uh, SRF. Um, uh, whereas, uh, and therefore the cells are pretty much addicted to this pathway and therefore uh, all of the components of this, uh, this pathway should be essential. In fact, uh, um, we know that uh, we saw that uh, make ERK in fact, uh, dependencies in, in skin are related to the BRAF mutation. However, we were very surprised to see that there is no uh, relationship, statistical relationship between uh, BRAF mutation and essentiality of SRF. So we were wondering, since SRF is a, is a skin specific um, uh, transcription, uh, essential transcription factor, uh, are there any other uh, skin specific transcription factors that are um, that would be, uh, let's say, uh, causing this skin specific SRF um, uh, essentiality. Um, and for that reason, uh, we, we created a cell line that expresses GFP whenever um, SRF, is act uh, SRF is activated, SRE is activated, sorry. Uh, and here you can see just the control. So the parental cell line is here. The cell line is green when you, because it's consecutively active, the map kinase pathway is consecutively active. When you kill SRF, it goes down. When you put a MEK inhibitor, it goes down. When you kill a map kinase one, it goes down. So we're confident the cell line uh, is a reporter for um, SRF activity. Um, and then if we look at our, our uh, BRAF uh, SEN, we see here uh, th these, uh, these skin specific um, uh, um, uh, genes, uh, skin specific essential genes. And we pick the two that were the most essential uh, and we did the uh, uh, knockouts and we saw how this affects uh, the GFP. And we see that um, uh, MITF, sorry, 
the control is map kinase one, you kill map kinase one, it goes down. Uh, but uh, when we knock out uh, M MITF, we didn't see uh, any change to, uh, to compare to the control. However, when we knock out SOX10, we saw a, a significant reduction in the GFP. Um, and here's the, the positive control of the SRF. So there seems to be some kind of relationship between SOX10 uh, and, uh, and SRF, but not MITF. Uh, of course, we didn't follow up uh, this experiment, but it, it just shows that uh, the kind of experiments you can design based on this uh, sense. So basically we made the hypothesis that SRF is essential due to BRAF. Uh, we found that it's not the case. We identified potential other genes that could be related and we then went and validated SOX10 for this. Um, yeah. Uh, another application of the of the web server could be to find the uh, to find the, let's say relevant uh, hot uh, cancer pathways that are specific to a specific context. So here, because we were interested in melanoma, uh, we focused on NRAS methan melanoma, which doesn't have that many uh, known uh, treatments at the moment. Um, and uh, we extracted uh, all the gene the sen of uh, of NRAS, and we overlaid it on a protein protein interaction network. So here you see in color. Uh, all the, the essentiality score of um, of the um, of the genes in the context of NRAS uh, mutation, uh, and the links uh, indicate uh, interactions from uh, protein protein interaction network from string. Um, and if we do an enrichment analysis of this, sorry, you can see here different pathways that are uh, seem to be enriched as essential. So these could be potential pathways to target. Um, and if we look into the network, what is close by here, RAF1 and SHOCK2 are known targets in NRAS mutant melanoma. And we have here also close by IGF1R, which is quite uh, uh, targetable because it's already targeted as a as a, as a, for BRAF for BRAF metamelanoma that is resistant to treatment. And uh, you can see here that actually um, um, when uh, we have a mutant NRAS, we have a significantly increased uh, IGF1R essentiality, whereas this is actually the opposite for uh, BRAF. So this could be potential target for uh, endless mutant melanoma that is effective. Something to be validated in the future. So yeah, so this uh, sums up uh, send tools. So uh, we have uh, created this user-friendly tool uh, to navigate uh, context-specific vulnerabilities. And I forgot to put the link here, but it's pretty much sendtools.com. Um, the context can be the mutational background, the gene expression, copy number variation, drug response, but also you can customize it so you can put in your own cell lines or there's a, a user-friendly interface that you can pick the different groups of cells, cell types that you want to include as a background or as a test group. Um, and then you, and, and then in this through the study, we identified about 200 uh, new core essential genes, which also included new essential processes. And if you integrate it with protein interaction networks, which we have now implemented in the web server, um, you can uh, prioritize uh, new therapeutic targets. And uh, the nice thing about the web server is that it's a modular, so we can easily implement uh, other contexts as they come available. So we could, we could do protein abundance, we could do different uh, I don't know, phosphorylation, uh, additional drug information, drug synergy, et cetera, uh, in the future. So I think uh, I can, Maybe we can pause here for questions on this section before I move on. If yes, anybody has good. questions. Yeah. Just post your questions or raise your hand um, with Zoom um, for the people joining on YouTube. We are tracking also the live stream um, comments. Um, I'd have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, thanks a lot. That's very interesting. Um, I'm coming coming back to the robustness of of the how did you call it the core essential, core essential. Core. Mm -hmm. yeah i mean if you now um bring that to a more personalized medicine a, a translational application mm -hmm. would it mean that every patient has a different set of core essential genes or uh, how yeah so the definition of core essential is the is the genes that are essential for everybody and all the cells so every patient would have the course would, would have these genes as core essential the same ones then the the, the for precision medicine the context specific gene, uh, genes are what we care about so if a specific patient has a, a nras mutation in their skin cells for example right then yeah. they have a, a different essentiality network so the, these networks these uh, genes that are essential in that context 
is different compared to another patient which has BRAF mutation, for example, their melanoma cells. Okay, so what, what you're arguing for, for having really effective personalized medicine in the context of cancer, it would make a lot of sense to identify the patient-specific essential genes because you, you exactly. are the more essential, the better the treatment, right? Or the more exactly, effective. exactly. So the tumor-specific essential genes, in fact, not even patient, because the you want to target the tumor, not the rest of the cells. So, okay. so at, at the end, I mean, most of the the current setup in, in 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 cancer cancer care mostly aim at the the variants. So people argue that if you have the BRAF uh, V600E, then you treat it with, uh, I don't know, what is this? BRAF inhibitor. That's, but, but this is exactly the reason why they do that, right? Because uh, it's very, in oncogenes, the mutations, the variations, usually create a, a super, uh, very active, uh, that kinase, for example, or that protein. And therefore, uh, this, the, the, gene, the cells become uh, addicted to it because they have very strong signal coming through there, so they don't need the other redundant pathways, so they pretty much shut them down. And therefore, if you target that variant, then you can kill the cell. It's because, it's because uh, the reason why they target that variant is because it, uh, that, gene, that gene suddenly becomes essential in the context of that variant. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, and, and basically what we're proposing here, I mean, not only us, I mean, many people do, uh, I mean, this is, a, this is a, we're making the platform to make this easy, but I mean, it's, a, it's a, people do it. It's for example, in the, in, in the NRAS mutant melanoma, you don't only have to target the NRAS, you can target the IGF1R, which is nearby, and it's essential in the context of NRAS, for example. Like here. So IGF1R is essential in the context of NRAS. So people would target NRAS or things that are immediately downstream of NRAS, like RAF. But uh, we show here that IGF-1 receptor, which is targetable, is also essential when you have NRAS mutation. So you could target that as well, or you could do a combination treatment or something like this in these patients that specifically have an NRAS mutant melanoma. Yeah. Have you had a chance to uh, try these methods on actual patient data yet or not? Um, so, I mean, we don't have access to patients. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, uh, the problem is that the patient, I think, so people do this, like like you said, with the specific variant, they, they assume that this specific pathway is essential and that's why they target that pathway. So I think it, it is, it is commonly used in patients as a strategy. It's just that sure. this this way around it is used, but but not not with the argument of essentiality or how you ever would call it. Yeah. Because it's mostly uh, like build around the variants, right? Okay. I I, I was not, I mean I think there there's a lot of people that do it also based on essentiality, but uh, I I think uh, this is the underlying reason why it works basically the essentiality. So I think it is important to keep it in mind in the context of the patients. Yeah. Okay, I th that's that's all for me at the moment. Okay. Um, okay. So now, uh, is there any more questions? Sorry. No. Okay. So, um, so as I as I said, so using these existing data sets that are published, we can find the network rewiring by proxy and see exactly which networks are active in this specific patient that has an NRAS mutation, or which networks are active in a different. Uh, patient that has a BRAF mutation. Uh, but then we wanted in the lab to see, can we measure this rewiring directly and see what is happening actually in the networks? So this is still a work in progress, it's not finished, but uh, just to show you the preliminary results, uh, what we did is we did the whole genome CRISPR um, based um, screen, uh, but this time in the presence of trametinib, so which is a MEK inhibitor, we identified a set of genes that were uh, there, that were conferring resistance uh, to trametinib. And then we integrated our data with uh, published data sets from uh, Densital uh, in the presence of uh, selumetinib and vemurafenib, so BRAF inhibitor and, and another, um, uh, uh, I think it's another uh, MEK inhibitor. And then this is the set that we identified. And what you can see here is that these guys are mostly epigenetic and uh, protein, uh, epigenetic and, and, um, and protein degradation uh, uh, complexes. Uh, so how are these, uh, are these at all involved in signaling? 
because as I said, my group is interested in signaling. Um, in fact, this uh, MED2, that is a known um, uh, and, and well-studied uh, protein that uh, gene that causes uh, resistance to, to drugs, what it does, it, it's an inhibitor of uh, TGF uh, beta signaling. And so if you remove it, what happens is that the TGF beta suddenly is super active, and therefore the cells are able to, to go to do uh, proliferation and, and, and grow even if you shut down their BRAF branch of uh, signaling. And uh, similarly here for um, NF1, NF1 is a inhibitor of RAS, so if you remove it, then it helps the signal pass through, through here again. So, uh, so this is why these two genes are through signaling causing resistance to the drugs. Um, and so we wanted to see what is the effect of the rest of them uh, on signaling. Uh, so basically what's the mechanism of resistance? So to, for that reason, what we did is we collaborated with a company called Luminex, uh, which, uh, uh, sorry, with a company called Protavio, which uh, uses a Luminex assay, which basically what they do is they have a bead and they put antibodies on there and that uh, bind to phosphocytes, specific phosphocytes. And we measured phosphocytes on these proteins upon knockout of these, um, these uh, resistance genes. And uh, here we have uh, MED12. And as you can see, as I show, as I said, uh, they are, um, this MED12 causes activation of the TGF beta pathway and SMAD3 is in the, uh, in the TGF beta pathway. And yes, we can see it. But what we can interestingly see is that this is not the only effect that it has. So we see a more systemic uh, activation of signaling. And like this whole table is kind of pink towards red. So there's an activation of signaling throughout, the, throughout the, our, our targets that we measure with some exceptions. Um, and, and, and this also seems to be a signature that is uh, common uh, with other genes as well. So what we want to do now, which we haven't done yet, um, we, we want to, we, will sel we have selected two genes that we are going to uh, knock out and create clonal cell lines and get global phosphoproteomics data to identify what is the mechanism of uh, melanoma uh, resistance um, that provides basically this uh, signature. So that's uh, just, a, um, I just want to mention this in passing. Um, to summarize the whole CRISPR section, um, we are studying context-specific signaling by, first of all, using existing CRISPR essentiality screens, and also uh, through proteogenomic strategies to combi combining genetic perturbations with signaling measurements. And uh, we have created SEND tools that uh, allow us to navigate the cell backgrounds, uh, drug responses, vulnerabilities. And uh, now we are using this tool to perform a systematic study across all uh, cancer uh, cell lines to identify context specific uh, networks and uh, around specific, how do, how do the networks differ for each oncogene uh, across different tissues and, and perform this kind of study. Um, finally, we are also developing this proteogenomics approach, and, and, and we want to use this to, under, to understand the mechanism underlying melanoma drug resistance. And our preliminary results show more systemic changes in cell signaling than previously thought, especially in the specific backgrounds. And so now we're going to follow it up with global phosphoproteomics to understand better what's happening. Um, yeah, so this finishes the CRISPR uh, a section. Does anybody want to ask any questions on this? Okay, so um, so as I mentioned, this is a, these are kind of network-based approaches, and 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 we, we have we have um, several issues with these kind of approaches, especially when we're integrating with protein interaction networks uh, uh, to to extract this kind of information. Um, as I said, there's a huge uh, study bias, so we have all of this understudied space that we are ignoring when we are uh, using existing protein interaction maps, etc. So the question is, can we use data-driven approaches to get whole cell signaling networks? And uh, now I'm going to, to talk to you about the project where we focused on kinase kinase regulatory networks. And we wanted to use proteomic data sets to extract, let's say, a reference of sorts of a kinase kinase regulatory network. And to do that, we focused on, uh, uh, we used quantitative phosphoproteomics data. Uh, we focused on uh, the CPTAC breast cancer uh, 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 samples, which are 83, and another study from uh, Wilkes et al, where they used 22 uh, kinase inhibitors uh, against MCF7 cells, which are also breast cancer cells. And then what we wanted to do within this data set is to uh, uh, create predictors of regulatory relationships between kinases. So these predictors are roughly uh, under three categories. And the one is kinase A and kinase B should show uh, similar activity patterns. Uh, kinase A and B should be in the same place at the same time. And also kinase A would, should phosphorylate B at the regulatory site if they can have a regulatory relationship. And as validation for this, we used the, uh, we extracted interactions from Omnipath 
And we restricted this to, to interactions that are have two types of evidence, so that is better quality. And uh, to simulate the fact that uh, the networks are sparse, uh, we, uh, we, we used as a negative validation set a, a random sample of eight times uh, the positive uh, sample. So um, uh, for um, we put together all, all the predictors, and I'm not going to bore you with uh, all the details. But uh, uh, for how each one performed, but uh, the overall performance using uh, we, we put them together using the Bayesian active regression trees, which are machine learning method, and we had we had this very nice performance. Um, and I didn't mention before, but we also predicted uh, the sign of interaction. So we, what kinase phosphorylates what kinase, and also the, the the if it's activating it or if it's inhibitor inhibiting it. And we had the match correlation coefficients of uh, around 0.45, which is very good given how difficult the, the problem is actually. Um, so just to, to tell you, to, to convince you a bit more about the performance, um, here we have in purple the, our predictions and in gray is the random, are the random expectations. And uh, here we have uh, um, uh, what the kinase was. So is the kinase A or kinase B? So the, the one that regulates or the regulated one. And then here is the rank of where a known relationship lies. And we see that uh, almost uh, for, for more than half about uh, the, the known relationship was in the top 10 of the predict, um, rank of the prediction. So this uh, shows that we have a big enrichment of known interactions. And if we look at the publications of, uh, at the plot that I showed in, the, in my introduction, where we have increasing number of publications for kinase A, increasing number of publications of kinase B, we see here that in the well-studied space, we are able to get quite a large number of the known interactions to recover them. Of course, in this space here where not much is known, or if anything, we don't have any known interactions to validate. So the, um, given the performance up here, we think that uh, we are pretty confident that this region here also is enriched in known interactions. And it's a good place uh, to start exploring uh, the dark space of cell signaling. Uh, as an additional validation, I told you we used uh, in Omni from OmniPath uh, things that, um, interactions that had the two sources or more, uh, but if we use the ones that are single source, you can still see that we have a much higher uh, distribution of our prediction score compared to a uh, completely um, um, unknown, let's say, random, uh, unknown background, let's say. Um, we also then wanted to validate it using experimental data. So uh, luckily, around the time we uh, um, submitted the paper, uh, these two papers uh, came out. So this one is an in vitro study, so where they, they took a cell uh, lysates, and then they put the kinds on top and saw where, um, what, kind of, uh, what substitute do these kinds of phosphorylate. And then there was this uh, paper as well that um, uh, they took cell lines and they used the kinase inhibitors and, and they developed an algorithm to predict the downstream substrates of these kinases that they perturbed. Um, of course, these two are not perfect, but they, they are, let's say, additional support for, um, for um, let's say, potential predictions. And we can indeed see that um, with the increased confidence of the data set, we have increased edge probability distribution in our score. So the background here is, is quite low, and then the in vitro data set here it starts going high. The in vitro data set that where we only include functional sites um, we, uh, goes even higher, and then the in vivo goes even higher, and then where's the validation set is, 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 is um, higher than all of them. So this shows that the, 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 there is a, um, basically the probability scores that we produce are actually informative. Um, and then we generated uh, in collaboration with the Cutillas group, I, I forgot to mention that this this uh, work was a collaboration with the Beltrao group, and it was uh, led by Borkthor Peterson in my group and uh, Brandon in Bergo in Beltrao group. So I should put that out there. I forgot about it. So um, yeah, so we used the uh, new data set, data from uh, Mac, uh, from cells that we treated with MEK inhibitor and pre 3 kinase inhibitor, and we wanted to see um, if we take our network. Um, and and we, we see downstream of, uh, of, the, uh, of this, um, the distance between the inhibited kinases should be closer for the downregulated than for the upregulated or un unregulated sites using our network. And indeed, we see that the downregulated sites, the purple ones, are um, um, much closer, at a much closer distance uh, using our network for, uh, for, from these kinases than um, the upregulated or the unregulated kinases. And if we take the overlap of the of the relationship between our set, the Hijazi set, and the Sugiyama set, we can see here uh, some high confidence uh, uh, edges. Uh, here in, in dark green, we have uh, 
a date, um, an edge that is present in ours and both the other papers and in light green that's present in in uh, in, in those uh, in this is in either the in vivo or the in vitro data. Uh, and we can see here that um, here's where the MEK inhibitor acts and here's a down-regulated site. And, and we predict that the relationship goes through this, uh, this um, protein here. Um, and then similarly uh, here, if you um, inhibit the PF3 kinase, we have identified two links between SARC and CDK2 and CDK1 uh, that would explain the down-regulation of, of these two guys here, providing additional support for the network. Uh, if you want to look at the example data derived networks, you can see here that we are able from the data to reconstruct pretty much uh, the module of MEK ERK signaling and AKT signaling. Um, and, and if you put them together, you can start seeing crosstalk between the pathways. Um, however, when we start adding uh, kinases that are not well studied, that are represented here in more blue colors, you see that we start getting uh, uh, overwhelmed by these gray. Um, uh, lines which are basically unknown so could be false positive could be just unknown so the basically the the the, the it starts becoming a problem let's say when you want to, to use the network as a whole so to summarize this part uh, i we have i showed you that we have made the first attempt at a completely data driven uh, kinase kinase regulatory network uh, which performs well in individual clusters so you saw we, we found the map kinase part the maker uh, module the akt module but if we and, and it works well for science but if we look at it at the full uh, uh, network level, there are too many unvalidated false positive edges. So, uh, so the questions here are, first of all, can we expand this network to include non-kinase substrates so that it's not only restricted to kinase-kinase uh, regulatory networks? Uh, and also, can we use this network as an informative prior to get unbiased context-specific signal networks from omics data sets? So, Yes, it is full of uh, things that we don't know or false positives, but if we use this instead of uh, prior knowledge networks, do we get a more unbiased the context specific signaling networks? And uh, we have uh, some preliminary results for this. Um, uh, here, um, uh, we have expanded the network to kinase substrates. Um, and uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, networking, which is basically the state of the art for kinase substrate prediction um, predictions. And, and you see here that um, uh, our predictor performs pretty much uh, uh, similarly to networking. Uh, however, it includes about double the number of kinases and also provides a sign for the interaction. So um, this was very encouraging. And when we use as a prior network to fit to existing data, uh, compared to the raw network, we have a, a big shift uh, on, on, the, on the F1, which shows the performance, uh, let's say a balance between the precision and the recall. Um, and we filter out uh, potential false positives. So these uh, preliminary results are quite encouraging uh, for, for, for the two questions I previously mentioned. And, and this is basically what we are doing with that now. Um, yeah, so the other thing is that uh, is, is, is we have in our collection about 600 data sets. And the question is, can we use these uh, uh, better so that we can uh, make this network even better? So there are several problems with using public phosphoratomic data sets. Uh, first, uh, they are, uh, first of all, sparse uh, data sets. So there's a lot of missing data points. Uh, we're missing low abundance peptides. They tend to be very noisy, both because of technical reasons and because of biological reasons, because there's a lot of phosphorylation that is non-functional. And also it's very hard to decipher the kind of subject recognition specificity. Um, and so to mitigate that so that we can use our 600 data sets for, for the purpose of, of extracting whole cell signaling networks, uh, Girolamo has developed uh, this, this diffusion-based method, which I'm only going to present this slide and another one in case people are interested to, to contact me about it. Um, so basically what this does is, is, is first you map on, on, on the protein interaction network um, the phospho uh, sites that are, have been modulated, the upper-regulated ones and the down-regulated ones, and you use a diffusion-based approach to filter out and extract only the network that is active in, in that condition according to the diffusion. Um, then from this, uh, we, we take the seed nodes, so the nodes that were significantly modulated in the network, and we take their neighborhood, and we create a matrix that represents basically um, that uh, local neighborhood, uh, the local effect, let's say, of each of the seeds. And then we use a, a, a non-negative matrix factorization as a, a dimensionality reduction uh, uh, approach of, for this matrix to then extract, let's say, a network of uh, super nodes. And each of the super nodes is a factor that basically represents uh, one of the signals, the major, the dominant signals in the network and underlying our 
uh, contributions of uh, the different genes to this uh, supernode, let's say. Um, so through this, we are able to take a noisy photoproteomic data set and, and uh, get the dominant signals from it. And uh, that allows us to compare better across the different photoproteomics data sets. Here you see the similarity uh, of data sets before, uh, before and after the, the um, uh, these are these are data sets from different groups, different uh, from the literature. They are also, they're not a perfect comparison, but just to give you an indication, um, here's data sets uh, where um, we perturb the mapkane, they perturb the mapkane pathway uh, before uh, the, um, uh, the diffusion and after. And you can see that consistently we have a, a more increased similarity of the networks after the perturbation. Um, and also when we do the enrichment analysis here for the different conditions, we see that before it's kind of a, a mess of the pathways that we get enrichment, whereas afterwards you get a much cleaner signal of the active pathways. So in GF simulation, you get as, as a top hits, you start getting the um, RB signaling, a map kinase pathway, um, a T cell simulation, you get a T cell receptor uh, signaling as, um, as a dominant signal. So, so basically this is an approach to get, take these noise data sets and get a cleaner, uh, a, a cleaner uh, set, that, a cleaner network that has the most dominant signal. And, 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 and this way we can improve the comparison between the data sets and use them for future, um, um, uh, let's say, uh, for, for integrating all of them together to extract more whole cell signaling networks, essentially. Yeah, so to summarize the whole talk, um, uh, we have, uh, so signaling responses act through complex and context specific networks. And, and, the, and, and a lot of the knowledge that we have currently uh, is, is biased uh, to the literature and, 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 and covers a very small, uh, not a very small fraction, but it covers basically around a half of the ex known kinases and phosphatases. And so in my group, we are taking data-driven approaches to understand uh, the principles of uh, cell signaling. And so far we have worked on developing tools that can take advantage of different data types uh, in order to do these studies. So uh, I showed you send tools, which takes advantage of gene essentiality to extract, let's say the active uh, networks in a cell. Uh, we have a CRISPR, uh, a proteogenomics uh, protocol uh, using CRISPR and, and signaling measurements to uh, understand the effect that um, a specific uh, gene has on signaling signatures um, in a specific context. I showed you also that um, um, uh, we developed uh, an approach with the uh, Beltrao group uh, and the Coutillas group uh, for data-driven kinase-kinase regulatory network inference. And also I briefly touched upon a network diffusion algorithm that we have developed that we're using uh, to better uh, uh, study uh, sparse data sets like phosphoproteomics. And we're actually using those also in single cell RNA-seq. Um, yeah, and with this I finish and I would like to thank my group uh, and all my, this is my group with the photos and the collaborators, collaborators are around here in the italic. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for uh, the, um, um, and, and any, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you so much for this very interesting talk and for joining us today. So please ask any questions that you like now. Um, you can either type them in or also speak up if you like. Um, otherwise, maybe I can ask a question first. So um, just coming back to the send tools, um, I only thought about this now, but is it also possible to integrate your own data sets in the platform or is it um, um, focused on the broad and Sanger Institute ones that you analyzed? It is focused on the on the broader and and the Sanger Institute because the, the reason is that um, there needs to be a unified um, uh, analysis pipeline for them that they are normalized that they are all all uniform so that then you uh, you are able to then make statistical comparisons across the data sets right because you group them all together. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Is this um, analysis pi um, pipeline um, online or available for other researchers as well? So we have uh, yes, everything is published in the GitLab. So nice. cool. everything is in GitLab, yeah. Both the, the Python, we call it the Python version of the web server and the Docker for the web server, and also the tools that were used for the analysis of the of the essentiality, the core essentiality and these things. I see, yeah. Yeah, I also have a couple of questions. Um, so um, thank you very much for the talk, first of all. So, of course, you now talked a lot about uh, phosphorylation. Now we also know that differential expression also plays a role in cancer in various uh, various aspects. 
your phosphor proteomics data, do you normalize that for a differential expression? Or could it also be that uh, a kinase seems to be, or a protein seems to be higher phosphorylated simply due to the fact that we have more of that protein? Yeah, that's a very good point. So usually whenever it is possible, we, we do normalize out the protein abundance. So we collect phosphoproteomics paired with, uh, with the proteomics and we normalize for that. So for our experiments, the proteogenomic study, for example, because they are antibodies, we only measure the phosphocyte. And you are right that the effect might be because of a change in protein abundance. But that's why we want to do also the global phosphoproteomics, which will be paired with global proteomics to actually see where the effects are because of the signaling or because of the change in the protein abundance. Okay, and then maybe a more technical question. Do, uh, do you do the phosphoproteomics yourself or is that in, collab in collaboration with uh, mass spec facilities or how do you do that? So, so far it's, it's, uh, we, are, we have collaborated with uh, Jyoti Chudhari from the ICR. Uh, for different projects, for this one we haven't. We're still looking for a partner to help us with the <laughs> with the phosphoproteomics. Um, our facility, unfortunately, doesn't support yet phosphoproteomics. They do proteomics and uh, and thermal stability proteomics and things like that. But because we need the phosphoproteomics specifically, um, uh, and we need it multiplex because we do many samples, uh, we are looking for external partners. And uh, and, and and I mean, uh, usually we we call, we find collaborators for this. Yeah. Yeah, if you're if you're looking still for collaborators in, in tubing, and there might, there might be some as well, but um, that that's uh, we can talk that about that. Great. Um, um, I, we of course also we also do quite 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 a few projects in fossil proteins, and we struggle, as you said, with the sparseness yeah. of the data. I wonder, um, and it's probably also a question to us. Uh, I wonder whether it's not uh, sometimes more useful to approach that in a more targeted fashion as compared to reach out for tens of thousands of phosphor mm -hmm. sites because then that's where the sparseness then starts. I mean, it's very hard to get that replicated simply for the stochastic nature of the mass spec and not, not picking every, every phosphor peptide every time. Um, have you thought about that? Uh, profiling phosphor peptides in a more targeted fashion? Say, if you know these are the thousand sites that I want to see and I design my targeted assays, is that something that you can you are, You're very right. Uh, you're very right. Um, the thing is, because we are, want to go data driven, we kind of want to go unbiased. However, we do go. Uh, we do we, we do design more specific panels for for um, for example our 17 sites here were targeted and for the to do it at a more high throughput and and for the um, for the um, um, we have another project that we are proposing and we are collaborating with somebody to do site off uh, on 30 fossil sites yeah, um, so we are trying to go in that route uh, using mass spec and doing targeted um, measuring targeted sites is also a great idea. Uh, I just haven't, um, we, you first need to define this site somehow. So, <laughs> so I think when, uh, when we do these data-driven inferences and we define exactly, let's say, uh, let's say another project in the group is to identify these um, uh, modules of signaling. So um, like units of, of what is the minimum things that we need to measure to get the signaling signature. And this has been done also by the, the Connectivity Map Consortium. Um, however, the sites that they have selected for, for us, we don't find that it's representative of the signaling signature. I mean, they may be statistically representative, but they're not representative to infer the pathways properly and all these things. So uh, I guess we, want, we may want to take something like similar approach to that to identify, a, 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 you know, as you suggest, a solid panel of phosphocytes that we would measure to get a signaling signature. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good idea. A general, yeah. my personal opinion is that the, the, the quality of the data suffers a little bit if we shoot for like Everything. world record numbers of phosphocytes in every mass spec experiment, because I mean, we, we simply cannot reproduce that in a, in a number of replicates and, and then the, the quantitative yeah. aspects suffer. Yeah. From. We always use TMT labeling for, for our phosphoproteomics data set so that at least we have them in the replicates in, in the, in, so, so that at least we can compare across the, across the replicates. Yeah, and, and we have a pooled, uh, proteomic, a pooled sample at the end, at the, at the last channel so that we can normalize across the data sets. But you are absolutely right. It's, it's uh, better to, if you know what you're after, you should go target it. It's just yeah. a lot of the time we have no idea. Okay, what, what else? I mean, at the end, you, you mentioned, I mean, pretty much my, my question was uh, towards what role does single, single cell analysis play in your research? Because I think it's, it's important, but you also mentioned CYTOF already, so you 
you aim at, at yeah. single cell proteomics. <laughs> We're so slowly also... starting to go in there. I mean, it's a very competitive field and, and <laughs> it's too stressful for me, but <laughs> but we are starting to, 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 to go into there because it's of course very interesting and, and you have the um, cell, cell, the cell cell communication aspects and you can really measure them in a unique way. So well, what Girolamo is doing, we are now funded actually by open targets to try to extract these kind of signaling signatures from uh, single cell data uh, and and, uh, um, and and cross reference them with bulk RNA seq to extract um, you know the specific disease cell type and signatures for for um, um, from the combining the two. This is one project, and another project is we want to get infer bidirectional signaling from these cell cell communication networks that we infer. Um, but of course, there's many people doing that, so it's it's okay. quite a competitive space. Okay, thanks. Um...